Hello, Hope. Uh, we are not meeting today because of weather and just a wet field and all those kinds of things, but it doesn't mean we're not worshiping. We're still worshiping today, and Katie will be preaching the third part, the closing part of our series called Three Windows, as she uh, helps us understand what it means through Micah 6 8 to walk humbly with our God. Uh, I want to remind you that next week we start this longer series on the book of Ephesians. There are small groups that are forming, and so you can look in our newsletter. Um, and, and get connected with one of those groups. We have one-on-one, uh, one-on-two -on -one, one -on discipleship groups forming. And so we're still pressing forward to, to grow in Jesus in this season. And as always, um, we receive an offering, your gifts that you all have given of your time and your finances, of your prayers. And Hope really is a generous church. So I just uh, continue to call you to that life of generosity as I feel called to it as well, as, as we seek to bless this city and beyond uh, through our church. So I'm going to pray for us, and then Katie, uh, we pray for her as she's going to preach today, and we're going to receive the word uh, as given by Katie. So would you join me uh, as we pray? Lord God, we pray this day that our ears would be wide open, that our hearts would be soft. God, that you would be able to shape us through Katie, not her opinions, but your word. It would shape us and encourage us and direct us, God, because we need that as your church and as your people. And God, give us the strength to receive your word and to live your word, to trust your word, that we might be new people in you, Lord Jesus, that we might make a difference uh, in our city and beyond just by the way we love and live for you. So God, we give you our worship. We give you this day, even if it is through a recorded sermon, that you might get all the glory. And we pray it in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello, Hope. I am excited to be with you virtually today. And I'm so sad that I can't be with you um, in person. We have a little bit of a rain check for today, but I'm still excited to be worshiping with you and sharing a little bit with you from Micah. Um, before I begin, let us pray. Jesus, we come to you with our hands open our hearts open and our ears open, Lord. Let whatever words that pass through my lips be your words. Help us to receive what you give us today, Lord, and let it rearrange us from the inside out. Lord, we lift up this time of worship and study to you. We praise you. Amen. All right, so uh, we are wrapping up uh, the Micah series today, and we are going to be looking at what it looks like to walk humbly with God. And what this really is, uh, you may have already guessed it, is a, an up in and out series. But we've been doing it backwards, which works for me because I feel like most things in my life, I've done them a little backwards. Uh, I was always the, the person who got the instruction manual when I was putting something together and looked at how it was supposed to look at the end and tried to work my way backwards. And sometimes that works, but a lot of times it means you miss some really small, important step or some intricate detail that's at the front that is uh, just uh, imperative to the whole thing working together. And so when I look at Micah and I look at this passage that tells us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God, I find myself thinking that it's a little bit backwards. Um, because I know that in my life, I find it pretty difficult to act justly and love mercy if I'm not walking humbly with God. And uh, I think there's, there's many times in our lives that we try to kind of work from the outside in. We think, if I do this, it'll make me love more. If I uh, do that, it'll, it'll help me be more of whatever I'm looking for. And, and I think there's a bit of a temptation to look at this passage and just see the action items. The, the acting justly and the loving mercy. But what we, we really see when we look at this is that even though it, it's out and in, the whole thing is hung together by the up piece, the walking humbly with God. That gives us our how for all the rest of it. And so I, I want to jump actually back since we're in the process of moving backwards. I want to look at a few of the... Um, the lines before we get to Micah 6 8. So just, just further up in the passage before we get to this big question. Um, and and it, it starts in, in verse 6. It says, 
with what shall I come before the Lord? And so this question isn't an old question or a new question. This is, this is a question we all have. What does it take for me to come before the Lord? What does it take for me to be able to approach God? What does it take for me to have connection and intimacy and relationship with God? And um, Micah writes here, what will it take for me to go and bow down before the exalted God? He recognizes God's up here and he's down here. What will it take for him to be able to bridge that gap? And what, he, what we learn is what won't work first. We see um, Micah say, Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? So burnt offerings, they were um, to mitigate the gap. It was something you would give in a priest to be able to enter the temple. It's a way of... of of, uh, of reaching the distance between us and God. We would, you'd give your gifts. And he continues, Will it please the Lord if I give 10,000 rams or 10,000 rivers of oil? So he's basically saying, would all the money in the world, would all the wealth, would all the prestige, would all the status, he almost sounds like Solomon here, with everything that I have acquired or could acquire, would that be enough to bring me into proximity with God, to bring me into closest and right relationship with God? Could I be reconciled if I were to gift all of these precious things. And we, we intrinsically get that the answer is no. It's a rhetorical question, but we see that that's not it. And so the author actually goes on. And he, he knows that part of the separation between him and God is also the sin, the transgression in him, in his life, in his heart. He says, for this sin or this trans transgression, shall I offer my firstborn son or the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul. So we see what Micah is saying here. He's saying, because of the brokenness in me, could I, could I experience the ultimate pain, the loss of my firstborn son, my heritage, my legacy, my, my wealth, my family, my name, if I were to offer that, like Abraham did in Isaac, if I were to offer that, could I be put in right relationship with God? Could I be reconciled? And what we see is God answering. It's none of these things. It's not all the wealth. It's not the calves. It's not the rams. It's not all the money. It's not all the tithing. It's not all the charity. It's not all the works. It's not all the acts. It's not all the deeds. It's not all the punishment. It's not all the pain. What we see is he says, He has shown you, O mortal. This is where we have been in the last three weeks. We, we see what is good and what does the Lord require of you. Here's the answer. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And so why do I take a step back? Because I think that when we, we think about what it takes to be in right relationship with God and we hear, okay, act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God, we also have to know what it's not. It's not all the things we think we can do to earn God's love and favor and approval. Um, we can't buy God. We can't sacrifice our way to God. Um, and so what we see is this command to do these three things. And, and this brings me to the place where um, we see the, the truth, the compelling how. You know, how are we to live in this way? And... The command is to walk humbly with God. The first part of that is walk, to have an intimate connection, an intimate relationship. Adam and Eve walked in the garden with God. That means that they were intimately connected to the Lord. There was no separation. They were living life with God. And then the second part, humbly. Um, I'm sure everybody who's hearing this message has been humbled at some point or another in life. And it's not typically a comfortable thing. And in the Bible, so many times where people fall, find themselves in the presence of the Lord, they are in fear and trembling. They are, they are awe-inspired. Um, sometimes they're terrified because God is so big and powerful and holy and magnificent that they find themselves realizing, humbled, how small they are, um, how little they are in comparison to God. And I think, I think it's C.S. Lewis that says, that in the presence of the Lord, all of our grievances, all of our complaints, all of our bitterness, it shrinks. It's very small. All the things we would bring to God become very small in the presence and the love and the goodness of God. But what also becomes clear in the presence of the Lord is that um, 
We are separate. We are small. We are undeserving. And so this, this is the piece where, you know, Mike is able to look back and in that verse about sacrifice of a firstborn child, he can think of Abraham and Isaac. And we can know where this story is going and know that that it is God who, who gives the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And when we really fix our eyes and our hearts on this idea of the cross, which we've heard so many times and we've grown up with perhaps or um, listened to over and over again that it can almost, we can forget the intensity and magnitude of this truth that on the cross, what we see is Micah 6, 8 played out perfectly. We see perfect adjustment, justice in Jesus' death. And we see unfathomable mercy in the gift of life and freedom that's given to us through this Holy Spirit. And then we see Jesus' unflinching humility, that he would die a criminal's death, a humble death, that he would follow the will of God all the way to the cross, that he would be in perfect will and perfect obedience with the Father for the joy set before him. I just kind of snuck that in there, but I'm going to talk about it more. For the joy set before Christ, he goes to the cross. And he lives this perfect obedience in his life. And he gives up his death in perfect obedience. He is humbled on the cross in perfect justice for the sins of the entire world are mediated in that one incredible act. And then mercy for all of humanity is extended through the love of God. And like I said, it's, that's not new news to most of us. But I wonder how much we allow our lives to be changed by it. Um, because love will rearrange you. Love will humble you. Love and grace and mercy will change the way that your heart beats. Um, I didn't get permission for this, this uh, sermon illustration, so I ask forgiveness in advance. But... Um, there was a time after my brother graduated from college that he came to live with me. And I was living abroad at the time. I was um, out in New Zealand and I was doing kind of a gap year thing. And Michael, my brother in New York, came to, to live with me. And we worked together on a farm out there and traveled together. And I was so stoked for him to come live with me. I was just really pumped. And he was out there for a couple months. and. But there was something a little different when he arrived. He was different. And um, I learned quickly that in his last few weeks at college, he'd met somebody, um, a girl named Brittany, uh, sweet. He, my brother was in cooking school, and she was a baker, and she was this teeny little Italian from New York. And my brother comes to New Zealand, and, I, and he's different. Um, we've got all these plans and he says, well, but I'm going to have to set aside like a couple hours every day to Skype Brittany. I'm like, oh, you know, and I'm going to have to make sure we stay in places with Wi-Fi so I can talk to Brittany. And I said, okay. And I might have to, um, you know, not do this or do that so I can make sure I can be in touch with Brittany. And I was just astonished. I'd never seen my brother, um, in, in a fit like this before, to be honest. And what I saw was actually incredible I saw a man that was being rearranged by love and it wasn't just affecting um, his heart it was affecting his actions it was affecting his behaviors it was affecting his calendar and schedule and timing and pocketbook it was affecting every aspect of his life and so for the next two months that my brother lived with me, um, we shared a loft, but there was a teeny little kind of attic room, and he would go into the attic to, to Skype her. And I could hear him in such a gentle voice and with just such kind words, giving his heart to this, this incredible woman who's now my sister-in-law. And um, I just remember thinking, this is a side of my brother I did not know existed. And I was... Uh, you know, at first it was a little different to me, but then later I was just so grateful because she had unlocked something in him. The love that they were beginning to uh, share was rearranging both of them and it was changing them into different people. And I know that all of us can pause and think of being loved. I mean, we can certainly think of people who we've loved and how that's changed us from the inside out. 
But I'd really love to pause and think for a moment about somebody who really loved you. Somebody who loved you so deeply and with such grace and generosity and mercy and long suffering and faithfulness that it changed you. Their love for you changed you. Not your love for them, not anything you did for them or could do for them, but their unfailing love for you. And they're just human, so I'm sure there were shortcomings and failings. But there's somebody in each of our lives who changed us, whose love rearranged us, um, who made us think differently and behave differently, like my brother, who made us into different people because that love was so expansive that as it worked its way into our souls, it made more room. And it is infinitely more so when we think about the cross, when we allow the love of Christ to come into our hearts and make room to, to make a home there. I think what we find is that that loving mercy piece comes a lot easier and that acting justly piece feels a lot more natural. And it, it might not be something we have to force or we get tired or burn out on because when we sit in that love, Second um, Corinthians says the love of Christ which compels us. This love motivates us into justice and mercy. And uh, Nate gave the parable of of the unforgiving debtor, the guy who goes to the king and he has his debts wiped and forgiven, but then the king finds out that this same guy was holding a debt over somebody else. He said, that's not the way it works. I forgave you. I cleansed you. I I cleared your debts. I gave you grace and mercy, and you're not going to extend it to your brother? That's not how this works. And when we really, um, I think, let that love of Christ work its way in, we realize we can't let the mercy stop with us. It has to keep flowing downhill and out. And we can't let the grace stop here. And we can't judge. It's, just, it's going to flow out from us. There's, there's no way we can be like that unforgiving debtor and hoard it or hold it back because we have freely received so thus we freely give. And when we abide in Christ, when we walk humbly with God, he strengthens us to love mercy and act justly. When we are are abiding, when we are connected to the vine, when we are loving God with our whole hearts, our whole minds, our whole wills, then it's, it's a lot more natural to love others as we love ourselves. And so I think my prayer as we think about what it would look like to get it rearranged again. Let that love be new again. Fall in love again. You know, it does crazy things to people. Um, My brother, after he left New Zealand, he moved to New York. And since that point, he's never been um, more than a phone call away from Brittany. And it's been so incredible to see how that love has rearranged him and how it's continued to work in him. And I think we can all think of of that on a human level, but what would it look like for that agape love, that love of Christ, that patient, kind, merciful, long-suffering, beautiful love that was demonstrated and made real to us through the death of Jesus? What would it look like to let that reorder our lives again, to expand our hearts again, to spread into unknown territories again? Um, who would it allow us to love who we've been holding back from loving? Who would it allow us to forgive who we might be holding back from forgiving? How could it rearrange us all over again? And, and the last thing I had to say with this, because it, it can become so precarious as we walk humbly with God, we can so quickly slip into that human perpetual state we get ourselves in of thinking, that we've earned it, that we've done something right and God is blessing us, that we've, we've done something good and his grace is being bestowed on us. Or, but what's, what it is, is it's a gift. It's freely given to us. It's not something we can earn. It's not something we can conjure up. It's not something we can perform into. It's just what we receive. And so we know we've fallen short, but we receive anyways. And we know that we do our best and we fall short, but he is still faithful. And so we don't make anybody else earn it because we know that that's not how it works with God. 
it is, it is truly a gift. And if it's lavished on us, then why wouldn't we go forth from this place today and lavish it on others? I'm grateful for Hope Community Church. I'm grateful um, for Jesus, for his life and death, which makes proximity and reconciliation possible because of what he did earn through his life, through his obedience and humility and justice and mercy. I get to experience the gift of grace and the love of Christ that compels us, that sends us out to live whole lives full of justice and full of mercy because we first are walking humbly with our God. I love you guys, and I can't wait to see you in person very soon. I hope that you have a great week.